That's all right. Are you well this morning? Man, hello again to pastors James and Deb. We love you guys. Miss you so much. Know you're having a blessed time out on the West Coast. Come on. Also, I know I got some family members watching. Love you guys. So glad to have you here with us this morning watching on web stream. Come on. Are you well? You know, I was going to tell you Merry Christmas, but I, I don't want to offend anybody. So instead, I'm going to say Happy Jesus Birthday. <laughs> Next time somebody says Happy Holidays, oh, thank you for not offending me. Happy Jesus Birthday. Wait, wait, what? What? Are you serious? I saw a buddy of mine put that up, and it just made me laugh. Come on. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. I, I want to I speak to you this morning. I really want to share from my heart more than I'm going to preach, but heaven knows how that typically ends up. I want to talk to you about, you know, Pastor James talked last week about the gift of expectancy. How many of you were blessed by that, the gift of expectancy? And just so powerful. And this week I want to talk about the gift of grace. How many of you could use some grace in your lives? If you're not raising your hand, then you need grace because you're lying. That's okay. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18, says this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph said to her husband, being a just, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for that which is in her is conceived of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, bear a son, they'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him to his wife, didn't know her till she brought forth her son, Jesus, her son and called his name Jesus. Powerful story. Powerful story. Turn with me over to Luke chapter 1. We're going to go a little bit deeper into this, and then I'm going to talk to you guys. As a quick side note, before we jump into this, let me just say one last thing about the Christmas party, just in case it wasn't clear. There are only seven spots left. Are there more than seven people in this room? That means if everybody wanted to go right now, the first seven of y'all who run back there and sign up, you're the ones that are getting in. So just to be clear, we're running out of space rapidly. So if you do want to go, you might want to be the first one right after service to get back there and get on in on it. Amen? Come on. I want to encourage you guys to come on out to that. That's really going to be a tremendous time. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. You with me? Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord's with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, considered what manner of greeting this was. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. Come on. Behold, you're going to conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, call his name Jesus. He's going to be great. He's going to be called the son of the highest, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said unto the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. Amazing. Amazing. So there you have the context of the surrounding of Jesus' birth. And you can argue, and there's theologians that say Jesus was born in July or August, which I was born in July, so I like to go with that theology and just think he was actually born on my birthday, but that's okay. The reality is, does it really matter when he was born, or does it matter that we celebrate him every day of our lives? What, what really matters is that we recognize the purpose of this season. And, and is it about gifts? Absolutely. If you're telling me it's not, you're lying to yourself because I love to receive. And I love to give. 
and I love me some cookies and honey-baked hams and all the wonderful things that come with Christmas, which force me to have to go to the gym more than I already do and lift weights. Amen. And I love me to lift some weights. Come on now. I need grace in my life. How many of you can acknowledge you need some grace in your life? How many of you are about to go see family members very soon? So, <laughs> oh snap, we're opening up Pandora's box. We're going to go see some family members soon, but how many of you know that when you go to see family, it's about to get all sorts of crazy, some way, shape, or form? Your uncle's trying to tell you how to raise your kids. Your mom's trying to talk to you about how you shouldn't be doing this, but you need to be doing that. I mean, how many of you could probably tell me about 15 stories or reasons why you don't want to go see family members? I wasn't asking you to raise your hand, but that's all right. I need grace, friends. I'm telling you right now. Can I tell you real quick? The other day, I went to seven stores with my wife in one, six hours of shopping, friends. I need the gift of grace on my life. I need grace. I'm not a shopping fan. Most of you men can probably say amen to that. I know there might be a few weirdos in here who actually like shopping, but that's all right. And listen, my wife's stylish. She's got it going on. That's why I married her. I'm thankful for her. But Jesus help me when that woman says we need to go out for a few minutes. I need the gift of grace. Whew, I need the gift of grace. Let me bring you in a little bit more of a, of a personal story with my family. Um, how many of you guys like to make it real? The, the Word of God isn't just something that you read on a page and get Bibleitis and go, oh, that was cool, an angel came to Mary and she got conceived of the Holy Ghost and I don't really know what that means and Jesus was born and Joseph was cool with it. You're nuts. You're nuts. We're going to hone in on Joseph in a moment, but last year... Lauren, myself, and my sweet little girl, Brielle. How many of you have seen Brielle before? Just a little cutie pie. And uh, we, we went out, spent Christmas with, Christmas with my family in Michigan, and we're over at a certain relative's house. I'm going to go ahead and leave it nameless, just because I still love them <clears throat> in grace. And uh, my daughter loves puppies, absolutely adores puppies playing with little puppies, anything fluffy, Jesus help me. I don't know how many of you have been to the dinosaur park museum type thing, kind of over. My daughter went there and tried to give the Tyrannosaurus Rex a hug, okay, if that gives you a pulse. So we're there, and this family member happens to have a dog, and, and we have a little puppy. I wanted a bulldog, but we ended up with a Yorkie. Happy wife, happy life. So my sweet little baby girl is, you know, hi. That's as high as my voice goes. And she's petting this dog and, and just, just absolutely loving it. It's this white, fluffy little thing. And I'm watching, and, and Lauren's watching, and we're, we're kind of keeping an eye on her because she's never been around this dog before, and she's only been around our dog who, I mean, that dog is going to heaven when she goes because she has been through more with my two-year-old daughter, Jesus, take the wheel. So she's only understood dogs that are very gracious, very that doesn't growl, doesn't do anything, just you go for it, right? So she's petting this dog, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> the dog bit my little girl. Hmm. I'm telling you right now, I failed miserably. Oh, did I fail. Hulk came out. Daddy picked up his little girl, grabbed my wife, and we left. I'm like, I didn't say anything. I just grabbed my girl. I'm like, okay, I passed the test. How many of you can relate with the situation? Okay, all right, let's just pull it back. This is my two-year-old. Are you kidding? This is my little baby girl. She, her lip is bleeding. She's caught this. I'm like, well, I'm going to. I'm thinking of ways to eat the dog. I'm ready to just. So we leave, and I'm calming down, and I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm going to go get me a steak, just kind of wind down. I'll be all right. I get a phone call. I get a phone call from the owner of the dog who, you know, 
his family, and they say to me, hey, I called the vet, just wanted you to know it's actually not the dog's fault that they bit your daughter. She wasn't supposed to be that close. Boom! My cork went off, bro. I took it. I mean, to the. I'm thinking you're trying to call me, give me counsel of why your crazy, psycho, demonic dog bit my daughter. Are you outside? I said you need to burn that dog, take it to the thing, and youth. And I, I went off. Oh, I went off. Can we be real? Is that okay? We're talking about taking the mask. So is that cool? Oh, I went off. My wife's sitting in the seat next to me. <laughs> Thank God for my woman. She just puts her hand on my knee and goes, it's okay, baby. The Lord says to me, um, Chad? I'm like, oh, no. I'm, like, oh, put, I'm putting my head down. He's like, you failed the grace test. I'm like, oh, dude. But how true is it that so many of us, we go with these great expectations to see our families. We go with these lofty ideas and these great hopes and you know, we go in so full of faith, but after one poke, you're, you're empty. You're deflated. There's nothing left. And then when the next one comes, wham! I thought you were a Christian. Can you relate with, listen, I just, I was vulnerable with you. You just open up be vulnerable with me for a minute. I, I thought about Joseph and I thought, there is no way. This guy looks, he's never been with his wife, which is a complete miracle in this day and age. They're not even married yet. He's never been with her. All of a sudden, she's got a little baby bump going on. This ain't a food belly, friends. This lady is now pregnant with Jesus Christ, and Joseph has not even been with her. They're not even married. Can you imagine what was going through his mind when he looked and went, you putting on a few, or what's up? What's going on? I know it's Christmas time, but... uh, Sugar cookies haven't even been invented yet, honey. What's going on? And I, I begun to think about this gift of grace and how in this season we really need it. But it's really not even just for us, is it? it it's really for our family members. And, and I want to hone in on the life of Joseph. You know, in the natural, Joseph had every right to stone Mary and kill her. Because the law at that time, you got to understand, friends, when this was written, Jesus wasn't born yet, which means that if a woman was caught in adultery and had a child outside of marriage, she was supposed to, by the law, be stoned and killed. Now, Joseph has followed the law. He's followed the Lord to the best of his understanding. All of a sudden, God comes and he interrupts his understanding of his word. I want to tell you right now, this is the season God's going to interrupt your understanding of His Word. And we need grace to receive what heaven wants to do. I'm telling you, how many of you can be like Joseph and see the seed of Christ inside of somebody else who you've deemed sinful and adulterous and no good and bitter and have no desire or hunger for God? How many of you can be like Joseph that looks inside and goes, I don't understand. It doesn't look right. Everything in the natural and everything that I know tells me that there's supposed to be death, but something in you tells me that there's life. How many of you can look at the seed inside of your family member who is completely crazy and see Christ? How many of you can extend the gift of grace? I know in my life... I. I have family members. I've seen situations. I know people who are living together who aren't married. I know people who drink like crazy and get drunk and all those things. And I used to in my life try to avoid those people because I thought, you're not even worth my time. You're not worth me being around. You're not worth me giving my attention to. But Jesus was the complete opposite, friends. Do you realize that if Joseph had not extended grace, we wouldn't have a Savior today? He would have stoned the woman. Do you understand? Joseph had to look at a situation that sounded crazy, looked crazy, and was crazy, but he chose to extend grace. Are you ready to extend grace to your family this season? Are you ready to extend grace to your friends, those around you, to yourself? Don't even get me started on yourself. I'll tell you what grace means. Grace means goodwill 
It means loving kindness. Favor of the merciful kindness by which God, exerting His holy influence upon our souls, turns them to Christ, keeps them, strengthens them in the Christian faith, and kindles them to exercise Christian virtues. We really do have an option in this, in this season that we're in, and it's easy to get distracted by all the, the fluff and the hoopla. And I even seen somebody arguing on Facebook the other day about Elf on the Shelf. <laughs> please, please, I, I want to go there, but I'm going to behave myself. It is amazing to me that Christians are more known for what they're against than what they're for. I think a real sobering question to ask yourself is, do your, does your family know you for more than, about what you're against than what you're for? How many of us could say, you know what, when I go see my family member this time, I'm going to give attention to my crazy, adulterous uncle. I'm going to give attention to my aunt that's hurting and, and is just addicted to drugs. I'm going to give attention to my dad who just... Everything in him just hates religion and he's been hurt by the church and he doesn't want anything to do with it. How many of you can take that grace that's been given to you and extend it to somebody around you knowing that just like Joseph, when you extend grace, you just made room for a miracle to be born? Oh, I hope you understand, dude. There's something more to this story. There's something more to Joseph than what we realize. Don't just read over it and and take it lightly. Joseph... Whew, you're more like Joseph than you realize. Joseph looked at Mary and he said, why do you think an angel had to come to him? Let's just blow away the smoke. Why do you think God had to send an angel? Be honest. Why do you think he had to send an angel? You think it because Joseph was fully on board going, yeah, this must be the Lord. He had no context. There was no precedent. Nowhere in the Old Testament had anybody ever conceived of the Holy Spirit and brought forth a child. Never. I want to dare you, and this is just climbing on what Pastor James gave you last week. The gift of expectancy does not work unless you're willing to, with expectation, extend grace. You can expect till the world is blue, but if you don't make an action of grace, you're never going to see what your expectation is. Do you understand what I'm telling you? I, I expect that when we see family and when we see friends and when we see loved ones and people that we care about, that they're going to walk away changed than when we've seen them this last time. I believe that. I absolutely believe that. I don't believe I have to go in and thump a Bible on their head and tell them that they're a sinner and that they're going to hell and that they're no good and they're never going to make it because guess what? They already know. What they need to know is, is I see something inside of you that looks completely contrary to what you understand, but there's something in you that God wants to give birth to. There's something in you that can overcome in this life. There's something in you that God wants to give you, and it's a gift called grace. Our culture... Our church, we as a people, need to be known for what we're for. We need to be known for what we stand for. And I'm not talking about I stand for regular marriage. I stand for this. I stand for that. I'm t- what about your family when you're around them? What about seeking an opportunity when somebody is vulnerable and they break and then their heart opens to you and in that moment you go, now's my opportunity. Now's my chance to give them grace. Now's my chance to show them Jesus cares. He loves them. The Bible says that the kindness of God leads us to repentance, not the judgment and anger of God. How many of you were brought into the kingdom by an angry God? Give me a break. Nobody. You were brought in because he said, hey, I'm going to take you right where you're at, bring you up out of your mess, bring you out of your pit because I love you, and I have a plan for your life, and I love you so much that I'm not going to leave you where you're at. But when we get around our family, it's weird, man. I know you're kind of looking at me a little funny. If you were honest with yourself, when we get around our family, it's a little bit like, 
We put walls up before we even get there, don't we? We put, we're like, oh, I'm going to put my wall up. It ain't getting to me this time because last time they bit my dog, they bit my daughter. I ain't making it. This time they ain't even doing this. Uh uh-uh. uh. I'm making sure because my mom last time said this and I'm going to, I'm protecting myself in the name of, that's what we call it. I'm protecting myself. And God goes, I can't do anything with that. I can't, you have so walled yourself in, the Holy Ghost can't even get to you to minister through. Do you understand what I'm telling you? The only way that love works is when you're vulnerable. It's the only way love works. If you, if you think that you're loving your family, but you're completely closed off, you're deceiving yourself. Love is willing to get wounded. Let me say that again. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Love is willing to get wounded. You want to know why? Because it's not about you. When you extend grace to that family member that, that, that's talking crazy to you and, and trying to give you all their opinion and their business, which is probably completely demonic, and you don't bite the hook, and you extend grace, you know what you're telling them? Your words and your attitude have no power over me, and it's okay. You're trying to tell me I'm not living my life right. You think I'm a part of a cult. You think I'm worshiping the devil in some way, shape, or form. You think I'm, not, you think I'm crazy because I pray and I tithe to the, to the church and all those things. It's okay. Because mark my words, they're watching your life behind the scenes, and they want it. They want it. I want you to be willing in this season to extend grace to yourself, to extend grace to those that are around you, I'm sure, by a show of hands, we could probably (laughs) count how many arguments husband and wives have already had (laughs) regarding the Christmas season. Well, I want to spend this much and give this much to this family member. Well, we don't have it. Well, I want to do it. No, we can't do that. I've already been to the store for six hours. I want to go home. My feet hurt. Michael smells just like it did when I was a kid, and my mom forced me to stay there for hours. <laughs> I called my mom up yesterday. I was in Michael's. I'm fine. I'm fine. It's all right. I'm okay. Grace. I'm in, I'm in, the, I'm in Michael's. I call her up and I said, you, I didn't even say hi. I'm like, you know what drives me nuts about this place? It smells exactly like it did when I was here as a kid and you left me in here for hours and hours and hours. My wife looks at me and she goes, honey, if you can learn how to have fun in Michael's, you can have fun anywhere. I'm inside. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, grace, grace, grace. I'm just going for it. And I'm having fun with you, and I'm, I'm cracking you some jokes, but do you understand what I'm telling you this morning? We need grace. You know, the Bible says that my grace is sufficient for you. That in our weakness, how many of you can say, you know what, I'm weak when I get around my family, and I might get around some of them that start to tell dirty jokes, and in my weakness, I give in. Or I might get around this one who likes to gossip, and in my weakness, I let it go. Or or any other of the situations that come up, but the Bible says that my grace is sufficient for you. When you get around your family, my grace is sufficient for you. When you start to feel sick this holiday season, my grace is sufficient for you. When you feel like you want to choke your cousin, my grace is sufficient for you. When you feel like you want to judge them and get bitter against them, my grace is sufficient for you, friends. I'm telling you right now. His grace is sufficient for you. It's time to see the greater reason behind the season. It's time to call that seed of Christ that's been placed inside of each and every family member, whether they act like a devil or not. It's time to call the Christ out in them. What if you made a goal that when you went to see family or friends or even just by yourself, that you made a decision that this year will be the year that God gives me an opportunity to share Jesus Christ with somebody that I'm around? And I'm going to see them changed. I'm going to see them touched. Thank you, Lord. Last thing, Ephesians 4.29. I want to end it here. 
You know, the Bible says this in, in the New American Standard. It says, Ephesians 4.29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such as a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. God will never put you in a situation He hasn't already equipped you to overcome. God will never allow you to be around people that he already hasn't anointed you to bring fruit forth in their lives. It does not exist. It doesn't exist where you're in a situation and it's too much for you to handle. It doesn't exist where you're in a circumstance that you can't seem to get out of. The only thing that exists in this life is that God has graced you with a gift to overcome. God has graced you with a gift to do what he said you could do on this earth. And in all the emotional craziness and in all the concern and the financial strain, there's probably not one person in this room who isn't a little bit tight financially because it's a time to give. There's grace. And if you fall down and you can't seem to get back up on your feet and you feel as though you failed so many times, why bother? There's grace. Could it be that we're not seeing fruit in the lives of our families because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble? Are we going in arrogantly like we have the answer? Are we going in like we're the best thing since sliced bread? Are we going in like we're, we're just completely perfect and they're not? Or are we going in like Jesus saying, let me wash your feet? Let me love on you. Let me serve you. Let me extend grace because I know you're hurting. I want you to stand this morning. I told you it was going to be a little bit different. I wanted to share from you from my heart this morning. I love to preach, but it's like Papa Chad this morning. The Bible says the Lord isn't lack concerning his promises. He doesn't slack concerning what he's spoken over you. But, you know, I wish we could have had time to get into it. Mary struggled so much with the idea that until she said, let it be done unto me according to your word, the angel hung around. God will always leave help with you until you're strong enough to stand in the promise that he spoke to you. I could take you even further and realize that Mary still didn't believe him, so the angel Gabriel had to tell her, don't worry, I know you don't believe me. Elizabeth is with child and she's six months pregnant. See, when God gives you a promise of grace, he'll always show you somebody outside of you that's walking in the promise of what you just were given. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Who is your Elizabeth in this season? Who are you looking at that has the grace and is walking in the promise that you've been given by the Lord that you don't see yet? Do you understand what I'm telling you? I hope... I I hope you understand what I'm telling you. There is an Elizabeth in your life. The Lord told Mary, you're going to give birth and have a son. You're going to be pregnant. You're going to conceive. Nothing in the natural, nothing, nothing in the natural said that. Mary tried to disqualify herself. She said, I've not known a man, and so many of you disqualify yourself by saying, I'm not intimate enough with the Lord to give birth to that kind of a promise. But Gabriel said, you're highly favored. My grace is sufficient for you. Where you think you're falling short, where you think you've not met the standard of intimacy that you've created in yourself to give birth to what Jesus has promised, there's a gift of grace. I've gone over about 90% of your heads with that one. There's an Elizabeth in front of you. I promise you, there's somebody around you right now that you can look at and go, I don't see it, but I see it in their life. God gave me this promise. I don't see my family restored every time I go out to them, but that person does. That person does. 
And I want to give you an opportunity this morning. If you're here this morning or you're watching, you might have never received this gift of grace from the Lord. You might, you might not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You might not know what it really is to be forgiven because the reality is if you don't know Him, you're on your way to hell for all of eternity, lost in darkness with no hope for life ever again. When you breathe your last breath, are you convinced that you'll stand before Him and He'll welcome you into His kingdom? If you're not, God's extending a gift of grace this morning, friends. He doesn't want you to go to a lost eternity. Hell was never designed for people. It was only designed for demons and Satan. We don't have to go to a devil's hell. We don't have to go to a lost eternity. There's a gift of grace. It's nothing that you do to deserve it. It's a matter of surrender. If I come up to you and hand you $1,000, there's nothing you can do but open your hand and receive it. In the second batch of you, you are a Christian. Maybe in name only. You are a Christian, but you're hurting. You're not consistent in the church. You don't read your word. You think these Christmas trees are up here year-round because you only come to church once a year. You're not connected to anybody. You're an island unto yourself. Think you'll just figure it out. I'll be all right. I've made it this far. I'll figure it out. I can promise you the loneliest place to be is in a room crowded with people and you are completely by yourself. And I can feel it in the room. There are people standing here right now. You are surrounded by people who love you, who want to help you, who want to open their heart and minister to you, but you are alone. You have walled yourself in completely because you are afraid that if you open yourself up, you're going to get hurt again. I dare you. I dare you to get out of the boat and walk on the water. I dare you to open yourself up again. And the third group that I'm referring to this morning, you're a believer, you love the Lord, you're in the Word, you're consistent in church, but you could just use that extra, oh, just that extra jolt that when you go see family and friends, you want to finish this holiday season stronger than when you started. You want to walk out of 2014. I'm telling you, there's only a few weeks left. You want to walk out of 2014 going, you know what? I started weak, but your grace has made me strong. I'm finishing greater than when I started. I'm forgetting those things which are before me. I'm pressing forward to that which is in front of me because your grace is sufficient for me. If that's you and you fall into any one of those categories, I want you to come up to the front right now. I want to pray with you and I want to pray for you. If you're watching online, I want you to join us in this prayer. It's time that as a body of Christ and as people who are hurting, we stop giving so much of our, our attention and our credit to our weaknesses and our failures and stop letting the presence of the Holy Spirit take a back seat to where we've not measured up. It's His presence that heals you. It's His presence that makes you whole. Get your eyes off of where you failed. Get your eyes off of what you've not done. Get your eyes off of where you've disobeyed. Put them on Christ because He's the one that can make you whole again. You're not going to do it in your own strength, friends. I'm telling you, you were never called to manage your sin like you manage your bank account. You were, man you were called to dominate that thing. You were called to be over and above it. You were called to give every part of who you are to one sole purpose and one thing alone. That which I long for and that which I seek is that I may behold the beauty of the Lord in the face of God. That's all I live for. It's all I want because I've realized in this life, no matter how many gifts, no matter how much food, no matter how much family I see, there's only one thing that satisfies. It's His presence. Nothing else works. I've tried. I want you to lift your hands. 
And I want you to say this prayer with me. I know we have different groups of people up here this morning, but one prayer is really going to cover it all. I want you to repeat this after me. Jesus Christ, I come to you right now. You're the Son of the Most High. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin, to wash me in your blood. I pray you fill me with the Holy Spirit. Baptize me again and 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 again. Baptize me, Jesus. Right now, baptize me. Baptize me. I need a new nature. I need a new heart. Change my words. Change the way I live. Come in like a wrecking ball. Change me, God. I surrender my life to you. I choose from this moment forward to live for you and you alone. And I know that I'm going to finish this year stronger than I started. And my family is going to see me as a burning, shining lamp. And people will be saved, healed, and delivered because your grace is sufficient for me. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for touching them this morning, touching their hearts, God. We accept.